tools. Uh, so a, a brief review of the technology flow, uh, the process flow. Uh, you course, start off with a, in the VM middle process, you start off with the wafer that's partially processed uh, with the early wiring layers. You create vias in them. Uh, and uh, what's particularly valuable is the Bosch process. We actually do two steps in sequence uh, repeatedly, uh, an, a, an etch step followed by a passivation step, so you can get very vertical sidewalls. Of course, how vertical the sidewalls are depend on how slow you do the processing. So from a cost perspective, you, 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 you want tapered sidewalls, but from a density perspective, you want vertical sidewalls. You cause passivate them, and it's common to do two layers of passivation for stress control purposes. And thus you end up with a, a wafer with a bunch of partially buried holes in it. Uh, you then fill those holes with the metal. Uh, copper is the advantage of it. its uh, low uh, resistivity. Tungsten has the advantage that it's better thermally matched from a CT perspective uh, to, to the oxide. Uh, and, uh, uh, but now you have in a via middle process, you have a, a bunch of partially completed holes in the wafer with metal fill in them. You, you finish the back end of the line and, and then do the thinning steps that allow you to expose the backside of the tears face. So you, you flip the wafer onto something else um, whether, whether it's a temporary carrier or something you tend to mate it to permanently. Uh, you then thin the wafer to expose the metal studs now, which can be used as the basis for microbumping technology. Or what I think is interesting, uh, and I don't have a slide on this, so the discussion this morning that Gil presented of using that as the basis for a hybrid bond step. Uh, that, that's potentially very interesting. And so you end up with a TSV enabled stack uh, uh, where you can do this repeatedly uh, and, and get a stack. So that's kind of the, the uh, historic approach to TSVs. Um, what's interesting is, is the potential for scaling of them. Um, the, the width, because of the, you can't get a vertical wall, you have to have a, a tapered side wall. 10 to one is kind of typical though you can do 20 to one, five to one is common too. Um, now that limits, that limits the pitch. The, the height of the TSV limits the pitch because of the taper. Uh, so, what's, so the way to get higher density is to have thinner chips. Uh, and this is, this, these pictures are taken from a, a recent paper from IMEC in which they, rather than relying on CMP to thin the chips, that's got limitations as to how thin you can make the chips. So instead you have a buried uh, uh, stop layer so that you can back etch and stop on that layer using an etch rather than using a, a grinding and polishing. And that allows you to have thinness down to about 500 nanometer, uh, which uh, in this paper they claim is a good, uh, uh, good compromise between thinness and the fact you want some silicon there to distribute the heat. Silicon is an excellent conductor of heat, so it's important to have some silicon there to conduct the heat. Uh, but nonetheless, you can get um, a very thin TSVs uh, down to a 100 nanometer pitch uh, by using a very thin uh, uh, back, uh, interconnect, very thin backside of the wafer, which is where the, the thickness is controlled by this edge stop rather than limitations of grinding and polishing. So uh, T, uh, it's, uh, IMEC and others are working on what they call nanoscale TSVs, uh, where you have nanometric uh, pitches that are possible. Uh, and that's very interesting from a, um, a Moore's law, more than more type of perspective. Uh, Gil went through the hybrid bonding process this morning, so I really don't need to go through that. Um, uh, of, of course, you, you, have to, uh, uh, you have to have a, a bond surface. There's a collection of, of pads. Uh, one uh, slight compromise with hybrid bonding is it can only be a collection of pads. You can't have any routing in that surface. Uh, where, whereas with other technologies, you actually can have routing in the surface. But since in hybrid bonding, everything that's exposed will be bonded. Uh, you, you end up, you, you start off with a uh, collection of pads. Uh, what we've done in our processing is uh, ask the fabs to stop at say metal eight or the top metal. So, so that can be the, the bond surface for hybrid bonding. Uh, and they sometimes do that. Uh, they sometimes don't as well. <laughs> but uh, um, but you, you have this uh, exposed surface, the plasma activate, uh, you do an oxide-oxide bond, and then you do a slightly elevated annealing step 
uh, that creates the co good copper copper bonds as explained this morning. Again, as explained this morning, uh, 1.6 to roughly 10 micron pitch is, is possible with hybrid bonding in production. Uh, and there's active research at, at CA Leddy and IMEC on the submicron pitches. Um, the, uh, uh, and, and one big value of hybrid bonding is relatively cheap. Um, I'm, not, I'm not disclosing any industry figures here, uh, but you know, it can be a few hundred dollars a way for pair. Uh, whereas, uh, of course, TSV processing is, is quite a bit more expensive. Um, and it's technology that we've used, uh, exploited quite a bit in some of our projects, which I'll explain in a moment and later in this presentation. Of course, the big success with hybrid bonding is in uh, cell phone cameras, uh, where you uh, have a PN junction layer or, or, or a more complex layer uh, bonded to a CMOS layer to do the uh, signal processing. And that's a, a cost optimized partitioning or disaggregation and a process optimum one as well. Uh, hybrid bonding has scaling potential. Uh, some limitations of material, uh, the copper grain structure, uh, how, what's the dimensionality of that, the copper pad volume, because it has to expand uh, a little bit uh, in order to make good metal metal contact. Alignment's a very important issue, and this came out in this morning's presentations. Uh, uh, depending on who you talk to, uh, you can, uh, you, you, uh, you, you get, when you ask different people the same question, you get different answers as to what the uh, wafer to wafer or chip to wafer alignment limits are. Um, in the center of a wafer, you can get very good alignment. It's limited by the equipment and the equipment makers are very good at producing high, high, high alignment equipment. But wafer run out, particularly the reticle to reticle repetition and how that varies across the wafer does limit the alignment near the edge. Uh, but it can approach less than a micron with uh, some care and can get better than that with a, a high quality care, uh, temperature control in particular. Um, but you no, know, the, 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 there isn't a limit on the alignment and the wafer to wafer process. There's beginning to be dyed to wafer processes that are available, even commercially available. Um, and, and this is very interesting, uh, I believe, from a design perspective, because of course the dye can be different sizes now. Wafer to wafer, the dyes have to be the same size. Uh, cleanliness is a big issue, so yield is still uh, an issue. Uh, but you can get alignment down to two micron. Uh, and that means that eight micron pitch is, is actually commercially available. Uh, uh, just ask Bob. Uh, <laughs> now, hybrid bonding is, is very interesting because it's, it's better than the alternatives. Um, uh, Thermocompression bonding uh, is a metal to metal bond. Uh, directly at high temperature, uh, if you're, 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 you're you know, melting the metal and bonding it rather than uh, just getting the metal to expand as in hybrid bonding. Uh, and so it needs a high temperature step, which is self limit. And the uh, pitch is not as good as what you can achieve with hybrid bonding. Uh, this is an Intel uh, talk uh, where they compare uh, the, the pitch achievable with hybrid bonding compared with thermocompression bonding. Uh, and a hybrid bonding, of course, can go down to submicron, uh, whereas thermocompression bonding is, is limited to about 15 micron pitch. Uh, and of course, the other comparison point is uh, solder attached, uh, typically with copper studs, uh, so you can get a finer pitch. Uh, commercially, that's limited to about 40 micron. There are people doing research uh, trying to get that down to, to 10 micron. Uh, but uh, again, that's, that pitch is a lot uh, worse than what you can achieve with uh, hybrid bonding. And this is illustrated again in this Intel paper on the slide, picture on the right, where they compare the scaling of, uh, of uh, solder bumping uh, at a 40 micron pitch with a scale that's achievable with hybrid bonding. Uh, and of course, this brings in the other advantages of hybrid bonding. You've got a better thermal contact, so you get, you get better thermal properties, uh, better power distribution, uh, contact from a power distribution perspective, lower resistance, uh, so you get advantages there, which as Sanku talked about. So that, that's a, a brief review of hybrid bonding and, and its comparisons. Uh, and uh, I'll show some examples later where we use hybrid bonding to its advantage. Uh, interposers, of course, are a very interesting technology. Um, a, and, and typical dimensions about 100 micron pitch, 100 micron thickness, I'm sorry, uh, with micro bumps at a 25 micron pitch. Uh, four to six metal layers, uh, more advanced fabs uh, go down to one micron uh, width and space, 
uh, but quite often you're using a legacy fab, which might be say two micron width in space. Uh, but you know, there's a variety of sources for uh, 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 interposer technologies. And you end up with an IO picture of 100 to 150 micron, uh, which is then solder bumped uh, to the ball grid array. Um, interposers are getting a lot of attention again now that nowadays. I'll, I'll come back on the next slide. But now here's a, a TSMC example uh, of an interposer for a Xilinx product. The uh, metal width and space is 0.4 micron, of course, leveraging what an advanced fab can do as opposed to a legacy fab uh, to get very high density interconnect. There's a trade off here. Uh, the, the resistance, uh, as you make the interconnect finer uh, in, in pitch, the, uh, the resistance gets up. So the insertion loss goes up, uh, making it more difficult to achieve your electrical goals. Uh, and of course, crosstalk is an issue too. So, so uh, depending on the range you have to signal over, uh, uh, there's the limit on how close you want the wires. Uh, and um, in this particular example with the Xilinx product, uh, they use copper polar micro, copper polar micro bumps to attach to the laminate, uh, C4 bumps to attach to the laminate package to the printed circuit board. And there's an RDL uh, on the chip side to help with the redistribution. What's interesting recently is uh, all the emphasis that's going on to large interposers. Uh, the high-end uh, uh, GPU makers uh, have reached the limits of how many HBM uh, stacks they can fit on an interposer and how big their die can be on an interposer. Uh, I'll show some pictures in a moment. So uh, uh, TSMC and others are looking at how to make interposers that are larger than one reticle size. Uh, and, the, the, and this is uh, one paper from TSMC published at ECTC, uh, I think last year or the year before, uh, where they describe how they stitch four reticles together, uh, that is overlap them slightly so you can join the metals uh, between the reticles and thus get an interposer that's uh, four reticles in size. Uh, this works out to 2,500 square micron. And you know, the value of this, uh, as explained in the paper, is you can fit a lot more transistors into the package than you can uh, with a reticle size interposer. Uh, so you, you're getting a direct Moore's law impact of, of more components, more transistors, uh, for a, 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 without a, a, a commensurate increase in cost. Uh, and you can fit a lot more HBM stacks, in this case, uh, up to eight HBM stacks. Uh, and uh, probably we'll see the next generation of GPUs uh, and their AI accelerator cousins uh, you use a collection, a technology set like this uh, in order to create very high-end products. One thing that's interesting in the, in, uh, in the uh, TSMC and others interposer offerings is put an integrated decoupling capacitance using a trench decoupling process, trench capacitor process. Uh, this helps with power integrity because uh, you're distributing a lot of current across a, a set of thin metals. Uh, and you've got a lot of power and ground noise, uh, and this is this brings a lot of capacitance very close to the power and ground structure of the chip, and thus helps control the power and ground noise. Now, of course, interposers like this are, are relatively expensive. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, you're talking about a, a very large amount of area of, of a reasonably advanced process, though of course not a, a state of the art process in terms of the metal stack. Uh, so you know, the cost is going to be uh, significant. So there's been a lot of interest in the last few years, and this was uh, launched by in Intel in, in silicon bridge technology. Uh, the idea is that high density silicon interposers are expensive. So instead, make a silicon interconnect only piece that's relatively small and use it just to carry signals. So there is an Intel product range where they can connect um, a Stratix 10 FPGA with silicon bridges which again are just small pieces of silicon with high density interconnections on them uh, uh, to connect an FPGA to a custom accelerator uh, so that you can get interesting uh, hybrid parts of FPGAs and custom ASICs. Uh, and, uh, and quite cost effectively as well, because the amount of silicon that has to be devoted to the high density portion is relatively low. Uh, the rest of this packaged substrate being, uh, uh, being uh, uh, laminate uh, for delivery of power and ground signals to the FPGA. Um, and, and so uh, this and, and its equivalent technologies at IBM and other places uh, are, are very interesting from a, a cost, getting 
getting getting your getting a free lunch, uh, getting getting the high density interconnect without having to pay for a large and expensive interposer. Of course, one area is a growing interest is monolithic three D, um, and uh, you know, you know where you can get higher densities and you can even with uh, uh, nanometric uh, TSVs or with hybrid bonding. Uh, the basic idea is some method continue fabrication devices on one wafer without making wafers separately and bonding them together. The big problem, of course, is uh, thermal budget in silicon processing. Uh, once you do a high temperature step, the following steps have to be a lower temperature, otherwise you undo the high temperature step. So the problem is that after the transistor fab, uh, you're typically temperature limited to 500 degree steps and it keeps going down as you go up the stack of the chip. So you have to have some way around that while getting the, uh, the, uh, uh, the stacking of devices. Now, one way of doing this uh, is to make the stack transistors in, in one set of process steps. Uh, and this is being explored as, as, as one vector that might get us to the one nanometer node, or if it's renamed as per the discussion this morning, whatever it's going to be, but it's after the two nanometer road. Uh, this again is an Intel paper. Uh, what they discuss is uh, uh, taking a nano ribbon or gate all around transistors where the gate, is, the, the uh, channels are buried in the gate, uh, which is uh, what you see at two and three nanometer nodes and stacking those so you have a PFET on top of an NFET uh, and fabricating that as a, as a gate stack. Uh, and you can do this in one set of steps. So the temperature control is not an issue. The big advantage of this is that uh, most of your logic gates will get you half the area than they were before. And this could be a dramatic impact because one thing you might be aware of as we've gone from 15 to 10 to seven to three nanometer, we haven't had as a big increase in density of parts because uh, it's very hard to, the transistors don't scale smaller. Uh, some of the interconnect scales smaller, but you, it's not like the, 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 the size of an AND gate is, is scaling with the uh, to process node. Uh, but this one, uh, you get a, a direct two to one scaling increase, which could be very significant. So that's possibly around the corner in the conventional uh, semiconductor roadmap. Um, so that's one way around the, the temperature budget issues. Another way around the temperature budget issues is to not repeat fabricating transistors. Um, uh, there are a lot of memory technologies, um, particularly resistive memory uh, and magnetic tunnel junction memory, which don't require high temperature steps. So you can fabricate them in the back end of the line. Uh, so this course leads to processor and memory architectures, which are very interesting. Uh, and, uh, and in addition, uh, as, as you're probably well aware, uh, carbon nanotube technologies also don't require high temperature steps. So carbon nanotubes is another way uh, to, to stack transistors Merely different types of transistors uh, in the back end of the line. The third technique uh, uh, pioneered by C.A. Letty uh, is to make further CMOS transistors, but keep the temperature steps very brief. So they don't uh, overly heat the transistors you already made. Uh, being French, they of course call this the creme brulee process. <laughs> they might call it creme brulee, you apply a torch, and all you're doing is caramelizing the top. You're not recooking uh, the uh, custard. So, so the idea here is to do a quick high temperature step so that you can uh, uh, drive the dopant atoms in, in the second layer of transistors uh, without upsetting the dopant distribution in the first layer. Uh, and, and they have a number of publications on, on this. So that's the, uh, 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 my overview of the 3DIC technology uh, set. I'm mainly a design person, so I've got to keep that overview to the level I can understand it. Uh, but, uh, but I hope, are there any questions so far at this point? And I apologize, I can't see the chat because of the setup in this room. So we'll, we'll keep questions on the chat to the end. So the, the, the rest of this uh, uh, presentation is a, discussion, is a discussion of motivations to employ 3D technologies. Uh, and what I'll do in this is mix in uh, some examples of our own work. Uh, and the first one here is provisioning memory, um, which is, which is a, a big one 
uh, and can le lead to the equivalent of, of several generations of Moore's law scaling uh, if, if exploited correctly. There are, there are a lot of applications uh, that need uh, both reasonable memory capacities and high memory bandwidth. Um, you know, the uh, uh, self-driving cars have uh, eight to, one source has 29 cameras on them, uh, all of which are, 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 are processing uh, by being, all the image data is being processed by uh, uh, neural networks. Uh, that have a uh, large number of parameters, a quarter of a million, getting on now onto a billion parameters per neural network. So there's a lot of memory traffic of the weights in the neural network and, of course, the inputs from the cameras themselves. Uh, and uh, that uh, is, is one application where you need reasonable amounts of memory capacity, but a lot of memory bandwidth. Uh, object identification in video uh, is a similar sort of application. Uh, 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 where uh, a Google network, for example, is a billion parameters. Speech recognition and al also uh, um, fitting the, the Google search engines uh, also requires a lot of parameter traffic to and from memory. And I'll talk about that in a, in a talk, in, in, uh, I think it's Wednesday morning. Um, and uh, speech translation uh, you have, is, it has up to 4 billion parameters in it. Uh, so these are the sorts of traffics uh, that are being generated and being run in the cloud typically, or in the case of auto cameras on an automobile, being run on the automobile. Uh, and these require a lot of memory bandwidth uh, and, and reasonably large amounts of memory capacity. So you know, let's take one example. Uh, if you have eight parallel uh, deep neural network uh, networks for image classification in automobiles, in self-driving automobiles, um, you, you typically have about 16 gigabytes of memory. Uh, but if you're gonna run this at 60 frames per second, you need 25 terabits per second of data uh, from those memory, uh, assuming a batch size of one. Uh, and uh, most of this is, is memory traffic. Uh, and so the, uh, uh, the, these applications, uh, and they're growing in the nature as well as they keep retraining the networks and more data, uh, need a lot of memory uh, bandwidth in order to be satisfied. Of course, the most successful uh, method of, of supplying high amounts of memory bandwidth uh, is uh, the high bandwidth memory uh, from Samsung and Hynix. Uh, this is used heavily in GPUs, uh, particularly in AI-orientated GPUs, but also FPGAs use a lot, a lot of this, and, and it's very effective. Uh, I don't have a slide on this, but we uh, implemented a, a, uh, um, a ransomware protection engine uh, recently as part of another project. And it ran a lot more effectively on the HBM provision F FPGA than on the conventionally memory provision FPGA. And actually worked out to be cheaper per operation to use the HBM FPGA uh, than the conventional memory. Uh, so this bandwidth uh, can actually be used to re reduce the cost of deploying the system. So uh, here's some layouts of, of HBM. Uh, and there's a logic die at the bottom here. Uh, to date, this logic die is mainly used as, as, as the memory I.O. system and management system, though there is space on there to do custom processing, which some are looking at, uh, 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 particularly uh, researchers in Korea that have access to the technology. Uh, and you get a good fraction of, of a terabit per second uh, from, from this. So uh, here's uh, one particular um, uh, uh, implementation uh, you've, you, and where you've got over a terabit per second of bandwidth uh, uh, or a fraction of a terabyte per second of bandwidth uh, from a, uh, a high bandwidth memory uh, that's uh, built as a, as a uh, eight chip stack. And you have eight gigabits of memory, uh, which is a good density for many of these applications. Hence, you're seeing a lot of TSVs, uh, correction, a lot of interposers, with HBM stacks on them because uh, of this combination. So there are several uh, HBM based products out there. Um, uh, you know, there's the NVIDIA high-end chips. So here's one, the A100, which is uh, orientated towards AI, uh, not gaming, um, where you have six HBM stacks. Uh, I mentioned the uh, high-end Vertex products from uh, Xilinx. 
uh, with HBM stacks, and in this case, two HBM stacks. Uh, this is slightly older, uh, but has a good set of photographs. Uh, the AMD Fury, uh, which has uh, four HBM stacks, in this case for a GPU uh, that's intended for both gaming and AI. Uh, but the, the, this, this gives you uh, several terab terabits per second of memory bandwidth, uh, which does get you towards, uh, well towards uh, many of these applications and their needs. Now, I, I would argue, so in conventional memories, um, no, they tend to be cost optimized in that the uh, DRAM banks are large, as large, uh, relatively large, so that the DRAM fill factor is high. Uh, and there's a trade off here. This, this decreases the access time and increases the uh, power per bit retrieved. So there is an argument uh, that uh, you can redesign the memory to go to take you to a different trade point where you're willing to pay, pay more per bit in return for having more bandwidth and in return for having uh, more, more uh, uh, less energy per bit. Uh, so I had a student, John Bjorn Park, who looked at this trade-off and, and we've published this, uh, where you, you, you decrease the area efficiency of the DRAM, that is have smaller banks and more uh, uh, address logic and, and interface logic and in return, you get an improvement in, rent, in energy per bit and an improvement in the potential throughput, now going into tens of terabits per second uh, in order to optimize the memory more towards these applications. Uh, and this is probably buildable through the uh, legacy DRAM fabs in Taiwan. Uh, so this is a project uh, that we're pursuing and in more depth right now, in fact, is the core of Prasant's PhD. So uh, memory bandwidth, uh, so far today, HBM is, is very uh, powerful there, but I would argue that there's uh, room for um, a broader range of products to provision memory bandwidth. Next is miniaturization for its own sake. Uh, this has always been of interest in the 3D community uh, and, and has a number of uh, demonstrations associated with it. So I've already mentioned uh, the uh, use of hybrid bonding in cell phone cameras and in DSLR cameras. Uh, one optimization there is to put the PN array uh, on one layer and the CMOS uh, information processing array on another layer. The big advantage there is you get 100% fill factor of your, uh, of your pixels uh, without having to pay for a complete CMOS chip just to carry the pixels. Uh, instead, you put all the CMOS in the second layer that's underneath the pixel array. And Sony and others pursued other optimizations where they put more image processing uh, in, the, in the camera itself on the CMOS layers. Um, and there's, as we uh, uh, create sensors that are meant to be implantable in humans and other applications, uh, there's, there's an argument for 3DIC for the sensors themselves. Um, for example, one sensor that we made uh, was of all things, a sensor to create safer soup. Uh, the temperature processing during the creation of soup uh, is the temperature profile is very important for the safety of the food product and they have to qualify the process. So we actually work with food science to create a sensor to help qualify the process. And we actually built this as a 3D stack uh, where there's an RFID interface on one layer uh, together with the RFID electronics and embedded capacitors on the other layer uh, to uh, provide the power for the uh, device. Uh, and, and, and there's been other uh, sensors pursued with 3DIC as well. Uh, next, uh, of course, the big hot topic today, so I'm actually not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but is heterogeneous integration uh, and chiplets. Uh, 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 the Intel uh, uh, plenary this morning covered this very, very well. Um, and of course, so the idea is to bring together the different technologies into one package uh, or even into one chip stack uh, and to achieve cost reduction as well. And this of course leads to chiplets. So one example we saw this morning is mixing digital logic in an advanced process. I should update the slide, uh, seven nanometers these days with analog circuits in a legacy process. Uh, it's, it's very hard to design analog circuits in a, in a FinFET process. Uh, the, the interconnect is, is, is uh, fairly lossy uh, and uh, the, the, the transistor level design can be fairly difficult. Uh, so there's a good argument for keeping uh, 
lot of uh, uh, analog and IO circuits in the legacy process and mixing them together. For example, this is slightly old. This is an Intel product uh, where the logic is in a, in a 28 nanometer process and the SIRDES IO is in 65 nanometer process where it's easier to design. Um, so you know, the idea here is that you can cost optimize the chip mix because uh, the, the, uh, the older process is going to be uh, is, is an amortized process. So the cost per square centimeter is a lot lower than the advanced process. And you split chips into smaller chips to optimize yield uh, and thus get a, an overall cost optimization using chiplets. So mixing different CMOS technologies together is uh, a lot of interest right now. And again, that was well covered this morning. So I'm not going to belabor it a lot. Um, what's also interesting, and I'm going to have a slide in this in a moment, is mixing more radically different technologies together. For example, uh, this morning we had a talk on gallium nitride on silicon, uh, which is potentially very interesting. Um, and Indian phosphide on silicon is potentially very interesting as well. Um, and and I'll, I'll show an example in a moment. And we've already discussed the image sensors. Uh, one thing that was highlighted in this morning's talk by the questions actually uh, was the quite significant variety of chiplet interfaces that are, are being presented and, and discussed right now. Uh, so uh, th this slide was actually compiled by Han Pan, one of my students. Uh, and what he did is he collected all the published information that was available on the chiplet interfaces. Uh, and as discussed this morning, there's, there's quite different interfaces here. Uh, you know, there's, for example, the uh, Intel interfaces, uh, which tend to be relatively slow bit rates, two gigabits per second for AIB, uh, five gigabits per second uh, for MDIO, uh, and, and reasonable power efficiencies, uh, and can achieve quite good uh, edge densities. Uh, HBM is, of course, a well-established interface um, that is uh, uh, slightly on the faster end, and it's very power efficient. Uh, uh, and, and thus, of course, is getting a lot of use. Then there's companies like Rambus who are pursuing more optical type interfaces. I'm not saying photonics on the wafer or on the interposer, but uh, the data rates that you see in optical interfaces that the electronics has to feed an optical interface. Uh, they're, they're, they're pursuing this also as a chiplet interface, a very high data rate. Uh, TSMC has their own standard, uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, TSMC is the market power to push a standard, uh, so this is potentially very interesting. And again, it's quite power efficient uh, um, and, uh, and, uh, and has a very high uh, uh, bandwidth density across the edge interface. A bunch of wires was discussed this morning. Uh, this goes a little more towards the high speed end of things, uh, 16 gigabits per second. Uh, but it's getting a lot of traction because of its openness uh, and is relatively power efficient at 0.7 picojoules per bit. Uh, then there's some lesser known ones, uh, bandwidth engine by a company called Moses uh, and the AMD's uh, Infinity uh, standard, uh, which uh, are potentially interesting well and go towards the more high speed of things. Now, uh, we, we've actually designed uh, in the AIB interface and it's relatively easy to design for. Uh, because of the, the more modest throughput per lane, whereas these uh, high speed interfaces require more intensive design effort, probably require acquiring IP from someone uh, to help do it if you're not a high speed design house. So this, this is still in a lot of flux and I, I look forward to seeing how the standards groups, uh, I'm looking at you, Tony, uh, uh, resolve this. Heterogeneous mixed signal is an area that uh, uh, is has had some exploration and probably can deserve a lot more. Uh, here's an example. Here we have um, Indian phosphide on CMOS. And the idea is in an analog digital converter, uh, the original buffer in the track and hold, where you grab onto the analog signal and hold it so the, the conversion can occur, has to be as fast as possible. So the idea is to build a couple of key transistors in the track and hold circuit in a high bandwidth HPT technology, specifically in Indian phosphide HPT technology. So you can do that step very fast. 
and the rest of the processing is done in CMOS. So uh, what you see here is a, is a typical integration process uh, for three fires on silicon uh, using gold uh, micro bumps, uh, which uh, have been pursued by other companies uh, for this sort of application, um, where you, you just build these handful of transistors, gold micro bump them to the CMOS, and build your heterogeneous integrated uh, mixed signal circuit uh, that has the best of both worlds to get high, very high speed. Uh, of course, what would be interesting, though it has challenges, is to do a, a technology like that and bond it with hybrid bonding um, or, or with a, a, a non-gold process uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to be more widely compatible. Um, um, or with transfer printing. I, I saw that. <laughs> I think transfer printing of these uh, devices is very interesting. We'll, we'll hear about that more in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in Bob Connor's talk. Uh, so we've been playing in the chiplet world like others. Uh, uh, what we did is built a, a RISC-V core that was designed to be uh, so that you could add, you could add application specific units to it later. Um, so what you see here is a RISC-V core with an AIB interface. And we made two application units that, that ran their own instructions, uh, a sparse CNN network, an LSTM network. Uh, and this is up and working in our lab at, at 200 megahertz. Uh, so uh, this uh, uh, chiplet world is, is a very interesting one. Uh, and one thing we've been pursuing is uh, designing processes you can add functions to later uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the chiplet world. So next, I'm going to turn to uh, improving power performance in area uh, and cost, because uh, of course, area is related to cost. That is, what can you do to keep Moore's law going? Uh, besides memories, which is actually is a big one in my view, that uh, a, a good 3D memory uh, is, is worth a, at least a generation of Moore's law scanning, possibly more. Um, but there's other ways to exploit uh, 3D technologies to get a Moore's law type scaling. Uh, and I'll give a, a couple of examples, uh, many from our own work. So, of course, one big motivation here is on-die interconnect takes a lot of power. Uh, this, this is a, a slide from uh, Shaker Belkar when he was at Intel. Um, I, uh, comparing the compute energy on a chip with the interconnect energy, uh, and uh, you spend more power on communicating uh, than you do on computation. Uh, and this is very well known. An, an adder takes less power uh, than communicating a few millimeters across a chip. So things you can do to reduce that power can be uh, very valuable. This, here's an illustration that uh, uh, shows this uh, in spades. Um, here we have a, a, a typical power distribution on a chip. The clock is a big chunk of it. Because this, of course, is interconnect dominated. Um, uh, but it's very hard to get down, I will admit. 33% uh, of the power of this particular chip is the clock. And the wiring is a big chunk as well, totaling uh, uh, typically about 30% of the chip power. So uh, if you can get this wiring power down, you get a big savings. Uh, here's the uh, length distribution of nets uh, taken from one of our past projects. Uh, we're in uh, 2D. You have a very lot, a lot of very long nets, but in 3D, you can eliminate many of those long nets, and unless you get a power savings uh, from the reduced average net length. So interconnect is a big part of this, so you can target with 3D. So the argument is fairly straightforward. If you take a 2D chip, turn it into a stack of 3D chips, uh, for each stack of two, you get a, a root two a reduction in wire length which works out to about 35%. And, and the question is, can you actually achieve that in practice? Uh, because not all wires can be petitioned uh, and, um, uh, and, and uh, not all wires are, are consuming lots of power. So, the, so one thing that we pursued, and you, you see this in Sunku's talk this morning as well, is petitioning a chip into two chips in a stack. And the idea is on one stack, you have part of the net. Here we see a flip-flop with two gates. You have the petition point between the two chips and you have um, uh, the rest of the net going to the second flop uh, in the next tier. Uh, 
And now what we've done is taken the, the, uh, very, uh, the industry, very effective 2D tools, added in some key partitioning steps so that we can divide the chips uh, design equally between the two tiers um, and iterate on that uh, to, uh, uh, to um, uh, produce a, uh, 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 the, to reduce the PPA. I know none, uh, well, some of you are CAD people, uh, so I could go into that in more detail, uh, but I'll say that, but most of you aren't, so I'll, I'll leave that. Um, now, the thing is here that many of the commercial 2D tools are very effective. Um, uh, the uh, uh, modern compilation tools, the modern plasma and RAT tools are very effective. So we want to use them as much as we can uh, by spending our effort identifying those nets that should be partitioned between the two tiers and placing very carefully where that petition is to get the most advantage uh, from running the uh, 2D tools. Though, of course, there is scope here for custom 3D tools in the flow, and they'll probably produce better results. Um, so here's one uh, design we looked at uh, in a project uh, in conjunction with Xperi, uh, where we took a, a, a chip and broke it into two chips uh, that bonded with hybrid bonding at a 1.6 micron pitch. Uh, and uh, very carefully, uh, target the longest nets to be petitioned and the nets that, that consume the most power or had the most delay to, to be petitioned. The green dots are the locations of the petition points. So you can see they, they tend to focus in a small part of the chip. And what was interesting in this is the uh, our results we could get. Um, so uh, you can, uh, in one result, we had a power reduction of uh, 21% which is, is about a Moore's law uh, node improvement uh, for, for power per unit performance. What was also interesting is we reduced the silicon area by 11%. So we actually got a cost advantage as well. Um, or alternatively, you could remove three metals from the stack, which probably wouldn't be as big a cost advantage as reducing the chip area, but, but is illustrative of what you can do. And uh, we looked at many design points in this. You have and in typical in ASICs, you have a choice between saving power or reducing the cycle time. Uh, there's a trade off there, but we could either uh, reduce the cycle time by about 20% or over 20%, or reduce the power by over 20% uh, using a hybrid bonding uh, between two chips in the stack. And, and uh, uh, the, this was very effective. So, this was a design exercise that we did uh, to show the benefits of uh, hybrid bonding on power performance and area. In another project, we took a very different uh, approach uh, to leveraging 3D, uh, and it's quite unique, so it's basically fairly interesting. And, and this was actually sponsored by Intel, and uh, uh, today was actually the PM, <laughs> so we, we thank him. Um, we particularly thank him for his uh, patience on our fabrication, which took a long time. Um, the, uh, um, the idea is we uh, stack a low power CPU with a high performance CPU, and we couple them together so we can move the compute thread between the two CPUs very quickly. And at the same time, we switch the caches uh, so that you're not doing a cold cache refill. So we call this fast thread migration. And the idea is when you can benefit from the high power CPU, you execute there. When you benefit from the low power CPU, you can execute there. And, and, and Eric Rottenberg is the, uh, the computer architect who drove that side of the process. And Rhett Davis and I uh, looked after the chips side. So this is actually built and it works. Uh, here's the uh, die photo. Um, here's the uh, two chip stack. So we built it in 130 nanometer CMOS um, and uh, uh, the bonding was done by uh, uh, then Ziptronics uh, and, and it worked. Uh, and we see very high yields in this. And we, we end up using uh, the DBI process as an eight micron pitch. Uh, this is an SEM of the uh, profile. What you see here is a TSV. For cost reasons, we use a fairly coarse TSV. Uh, and there you have the front of the line and the back end of the line. And here you can see the hybrid bonding site. So we, we uh, stopped at the top metal uh, on the uh, 130 nanometer process. Well, at least that's what happened the second time we ran it. The first time they kept on going, uh, which didn't give us anything that was very useful. Uh, not 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 as electronics at the, at the at the fab at the CMOS fab, um, and uh, and of course these are bonded using hybrid bonding. Uh, 
And, and what we found is an eight micron pitch was all we needed. Uh, so that's what we did, even though they could do a four micron pitch at the time. So two CMOS chips uh, bonded together uh, with uh, TSV for IO. And the point of this is that uh, compared with the running the, the, uh, the code in one of the chips by itself, if you ran the code in the heterogeneous chip stack, uh, you get a 13 to 40% improvement in performance per unit power uh, by transferring the thread when it was advantageous to do, that, to do so. So this is a quite different take on improving performance through 3D. And one thing that's very interesting about this project is it's 3D specific. Uh, the, you could build a heterogeneous processor in 2D, and we actually laid a couple of them out to try to see if we could do that. And we couldn't do it very efficiently because there's a trade-off here. You, you want the, we, we called the, the module that actually transferred the thread, the teleport register file, uh, stealing concepts from Star Trek. Uh, and you could either lay out the chips so they're close together, or you could lay out the chips so the data caches are, are close together. Um, and uh, uh, either version ends up being significantly worse than the 3D chip. Uh, in fact, a lot worse than just running the process in one core on its own. Uh, it, it slowed down the, the transfer of the state a lot and it had significantly more power consumption. So this is a truly 3D architecture that can only really be efficiently executed in 3D. And I think an interesting possible extension of this project is now that data wafer hybrid processing exists, is to, uh, instead of attaching two processes together, attach accelerators uh, to a process uh, using uh, a hybrid bonding, uh, again, using the resources of the, of the CPU uh, to expose the memories uh, and, and the state registers in the CPU, and exposing them to the uh, uh, sp uh, special purpose uh, uh, compute ACIP. Uh, and that's something we're starting to look at. In another project uh, with a quite different take, uh, we're looking at 3D uh, to uh, um, secure the supply chain. Um, the objective here, the problem that we're facing here, we're dealing with here is, um, you, uh, and this is more for national security interests, if you want to keep a function secret, you, uh, you, 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 you don't want to expose what the chip is capable of doing. Well, if someone gets their hands on the CMOS layout, they can reverse engineer that function. So instead what we do is what's called split fabrication, where we, have, where we fab fabricate the CMOS parts in an untrusted fab and fabricate an interconnect in a trusted fab and partition the chip between the two CMOS layers so that if you only have the data in the CMOS layers, you can't work out key functions of the chip. You obfuscated the design. And, and, we've, uh, and we proposed this uh, to DARPA, they funded a, a fab run, and we built a set of tools to do this. So the security is supplied by having the uh, 3D layers, including a hybrid bonding step uh, built in a trusted fab in this case, enhanced semiconductors called Bob Paddy. And uh, uh, this worked from both a security perspective, we had this red team, uh, and from a fabrication perspective. And here you see the, the uh, SEM cross section. Uh, the two chips in this case were built in 28 nanometer CMOS, uh, and uh, the uh, interconnect uh, built in a two micron with and space back end uh, with a hybrid bonding step in between. Uh, and, and these chips are. Uh, uh, came back earlier this year uh, and, and were tested successfully. Uh, so uh, the idea here is split fabrication to help in design security. Um, come back to that. So this has been tested uh, in, in, uh, uh, and, and actually works. Um, related to this, we've also been looking at an RFID design that can be easily ported between processes. So you could build RFID into a chip, so it's to track it through the supply chain. Uh, the thread here is illegal recycling, uh, which is grown in spades with the shortage of semiconductors, where uh, many uh, nefarious vendors have been taking uh, recycled parts, sometimes even relabeling them and upgrading them to a newer part on the label uh, and reselling them back into the market. So the idea here is to put an RFID component uh, inside the chip 
and it's a digital RFID, so it's easy to insert so that you can uh, interface and track the unit, uh, the chip throughout the supply chain. Uh, and, uh, and this is a sub-project we recently demonstrated. Uh, Cody Banashuli is the PhD student who did this work. Um, we've also done a fair bit of work on computer aid design related to chiplets. Um, maybe the EDA industry is addressing this, but one thing you can't do right now is simultaneous floor planning across a set of chiplets. Yes, there are floor planners that can work on one chiplet, but you can't co-design two or more chiplets together. So one thing we're building right now is a floor planner that can co-floor plan between chiplets. Um, uh, this shows a 3D version, there's also a two and a half D version. Uh, this work's being done by Han Pan um, and Rhett Davis is, is collaborating as well. And, uh, and uh, this floor planner is, is being uh, 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 coded right now. And what we want to do in future work in this area is uh, integrate uh, the uh, floor planner with uh, power performance and area optimization tools uh, so that you can uh, get an optimal design across a set of disaggregated chiplets. Uh, and this is taken from past work actually done by Rhett Davis in this group. Uh, what this shows is there's a very strong trade-off between area and performance. It's also a very strong trade-off between area and power consumption of a similar nature. And if you can model this trade-off and combine it with a 3D, with a, a disaggregated floor planner for a set of chiplets, uh, you could get a, uh, an optimal result. And what would be interesting in this as well is also deal with the thermal aspects, so temperature control. Uh, in any talk on 3D IC, the biggest objection that's always brought up is controlling temperature. And, and there's a ways of addressing this. And here I uh, refer to a Qualcomm paper that was actually presented in 3D IC uh, several years ago and actually won the best paper award. Uh, what they did in this work is did co floor planning of the two chiplets that are stacked together so as to limit the worst case temperature rise. Uh, they went from uh, uh, this curve with the temp worst temperature rises, I can't read this, but I think it's 86 uh, degrees or 96 degrees, to this floor plan where the worst temperature rise was 84 degrees. And this is done through uh, clever floor planning uh, or, or smart placement of the 3D chip with respect to the chip it's made it to. So what would be interesting would be to uh, uh, combine this concept uh, with what we're doing here uh, so that you could uh, pr produce a 2.5D or 3D design that's not only power performance and area optimized, but also thermally optimized as well, uh, so you can achieve your temperature goals. Well, uh, that uh, brings me to the end of uh, this uh, tutorial. Um, and, and a few key messages I want to leave you with. Face-to-face uh, uh, -face bonding, particularly hybrid bonding, which I'm a big fan of, uh, allows true integration of chips in very interesting ways. Uh, it essentially doubles the interconnect resources as well as the transistor density uh, and leads to Moore's law type uh, improvements in, uh, in power performance and area. And of course, you can combine this with high density IO uh, with enabled by TSVs. And one thing that's essentially interesting, which you can tell my interest in from my questions this morning, I mean, so what can you do if you can go below two layers, beyond two layers, and, and keep the advantages of the high density of hybrid bonding in, in four, six, or eight layers of CMOS? Uh, there's a number of areas in which uh, both, uh, both TSV enabled and face-to-face and -face enabled uh, circuits uh, lead to Moore's law type of improvements of, 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 of generational improvements. And of course, a big part of this is 3D memory stacks, uh, which are a, a generational improvement in themselves. And again, I think there's room for more, more, event, more uh, a, a aggressive exploitation of 3D in the memory stack, particularly for the very popular applications right now in AI and other areas where you need lots and lots and lots of memory bandwidth. And, and that brings me to the end. What I'd like to do is thank the uh, organizations that, that funded this work and thank all the students and other faculty that we worked with over the years uh, in order to uh, pursue these vectors. And I thank you for your attention. Uh, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you very much. There's questions online? Okay.
And no, okay, thank you. Let me know if there are any. Okay, Larry has asked a question regarding run out in wafer to wafer fine pitch hybrid bonding. Has anyone looked at tweaking the step repeat distance to compensate for this? Um, the step repeat distance. So you, you mean with the, they, uh, they do pay attention to the step and repeat process to try to minimize the run out. Um, this, I'm not a process person. Does anyone, anyone want to suggest an answer? Um, yeah, Gil, I'll repeat the answer. There, there was some work at uh, Novati done to correct for that, where they they applied a different magnification as they stepped down on the wafer, and they were able to, in, in one of Bob's projects, they were able to uh, compensate for the run out from one, to one wafer to the other. To some extent, they just basically moved the connections over slightly as they went out. And they had to do that. So, so Gil was just observing that Navadi had a process where they changed the magnification as they went towards the edge of the wafer in order to try to maintain the, the run, the minimize the run out. So, I summarize that correctly? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions? Great. Well, thanks very much. Well, that concludes the tutorial.